Great. Thank you. And welcome everyone to System Thinking Ontario again for October. Um, so we have a special update um, for October with uh, Katie Kish and David Mallory. Uh, David's still trying to get back online again, so we'll catch up with him. Uh, but the topic today is ecological economics. And so um, we'll go around in the usual circle. And um, I think the question for the day will be, um, how much economics do you know or don't know, or how much ecological economics do you know? And how's that tie in with system thinking for you? Because this seems to be a system thinking crowd. Um, and then more or less, I'm gonna turn it over to Katie and David to self-organize, because I think they can. So, um, so let's do that. So let's just go around and have people say hello. Uh, I'm gonna start, um, let's see. Kelly, say hi. Hi. <laughs> how, how much you know about economics or ecological economics? I'm in the economist right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Learning about systems. Okay. Humbly. <laughs> Chris, say hi. Hi there. Uh, yeah. Uh, Nice to be back with you guys uh, again, uh, catching up. I was intrigued by uh, uh, this topic. Uh, not that I know much about it, but I, it looks like a fruitful area to, uh, to explore for sure. Uh, I'm kind of suspecting that it's gonna touch on, uh, no, I better not even project that. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks. Dean? Hi, my name is Dean. I'm showing up to a few of your meetings. Um, economics. Uh, well, I, I had the job title Senior Economist at Environment Canada for a few years early in my career, so I don't know if that counts, but I'm not, I'm not really an economist. If that isn't an economist, I'm not sure what is. <laughs> so, Rose? <laughs> Hi. Um, so I first came across and, and became interested in ecological economics about 20 years ago and started reading about it on my own. And I didn't know about the connection to systems thinking until I came across this group maybe about six years ago. So I'm not an economist. I kind of read about it on my own and I was um, enrolled in the program at Schumacher um, that was called Economics for Transition and now called um, regenerative economics, and they never used the term ecological economics, which I thought was interesting and not, you know, the, uh, the authors didn't come up. Um, uh, but yeah, so happy, happy to be here and looking forward to, uh, to the talk. Yeah. Thanks, Rose. Elena. Oh, hi, um, Elena Leonard here in uh, Niagara-on-the-Lake. Um, I don't know uh, much about economics, but I've been involved with ecology for, I guess, you know, 15 years or so uh, through the Water Docs Film Festival, which, by the way, is happening this November 9 to 15 online. And uh, until the 23rd of October, you can make a $10 donation and get a pass for all of the 45-ish films. Oh, great. Thanks, Elena. Zad. Put that in the chat, Elena. Pardon? Okay. No, put that in the chat, the link. Um, hi, uh, I'm about to introduce myself, but I noticed David came back and he's testing the mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, he's still working on it. Um, yeah, my name is Zad. I'm a graduate from OCADU SFI program. Um, so I know a little bit about systems thinking and I've been learning alongside David and Peter Jones here. Um, I don't know too much about uh, economics or ecological economics. I read some introductory papers, so I would describe myself as an introductory level. Thanks, Ed. Anthony. Well, we can't hear you. <laughs> Come back. He's well, Anthony's who I learned ecological economics from. <laughs> so if we go back, 
we just had the 101st uh, meeting of the Strongly Sustainable Business Model um, research group last Wednesday. And so, uh, and, and you might remember, David, that, um, you, you, you know, we met Anthony about the same time. They, uh, he, he came to design with dialogue and, 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 and here and we, and we, um, and so I, I, I was very intrigued by Anthony's research in, in strong sustainability uh, business models and the application of that theory that he had developed in his master's at York. And so I was, um, one of the things that I saw that we needed to do to actually get his work you know, in really accepted was to have a, a high credibility publication. So one of the, one of the first publications that, you know, that, that um, you know, Anthony is a master's student, worked with me as a professor at, at, um, at you know, at OCAD to, um, to, to author a paper based on his, on his research, which he's the lead author for the 2014 paper on, on his, on the ontology for strong and sustainable business models. And then of course, developing the tools after that. So I've been, I've been in, engaged with that community, you know, with the, the SSPMG or now the Flourishing Enterprise Institute ever since then. And so that's also led me to being connected to a number of other projects where I'm not serving as an ecological economist, but I'm working with uh, you know, so Jasper Kenter's GAIN group, the Global Assessment of New Economics, so heterodox economics, um, a research team that's out of um, University of York, UK, and that includes people like Bob Costanza and others. So there's between the York and York, there's really, you know, really flourishing, to coin a, a word, a group of, of, you know, ecological economists that I bring a design of tools and an interpretation of those perspectives to be used in practical uh, tools and, and services. And the, um, and, and the GAIN project has led, led to another um, uh, program called Bounce Beyond, which I'm one of the, also one of the founders, I was a part of the founding team of GAIN and that led to Bounce Beyond, which is a, a program that's curating um, next economy or alternative economic um, um, initiatives ranging from bioregional development in Costa Rica to a, a fiber shed a, or what they're now calling a bio shed in, in Devon, England and the Social Purpose Institute is one of them here in Canada. So these are different kind of economic contexts that we're trying to develop as a type of um, kind of project accelerator for in that, in that realm, so we're trying to bring these these projects from kind of in from region to larger impact by by actually a lot of systems thinking tools. So, Anthony, are you back? Hopefully, is my mic working now? Yes, it is. Yes. Um, so, Anthony Upward, I'm in downtown Toronto. Um, thank you for those uh, kind words, Peter. Um, Katie and I actually, I think, took our Ecological Economics, Economics 101 together at York um, a little over, well, almost exactly 10 years ago uh, with Peter Victor and um, his book, um, the main title, which I always forget, but the subtitle I always remember, which is Slower by Design, Not Disaster, uh, which is a wonderful introduction to Ecological Economics, um, talking about what policy interventions might be required to land a growth-based economy to, to a steady state economy um, and, and how that might work. And that all those policy analysis was done using uh, system dynamics models. So systems thinking was right in there, but then conceptually the ecological and economics in ecological economics, I've always felt meant systems thinking um, because the first question that ecological economists ask themselves is what contains the economy? So asking what, what larger whole is the economy a part of, to use your language, David, um, of wholes and parts. Um, so I, I, would, uh, I, I would describe myself as a, as a micro ecological economist, not a macro ecological economist, um, uh, hence focus on organizations and business models is, is my uh, interest. And uh, very interested to hear a, uh, an update from Katie and David on, on what they've been working on 
and how that how they see systems thinking relating to that in a practical way. Great, thanks, Anthony. Um, Joanne. Hi, uh, I'm Joanne Dong. Um, I know the basics of uh, economics and um, I've been learning about systems thinking and complexity sciences uh, just under 10 years. Um, but um, I've always thought that systems thinking is a natural part of uh, ecological thinking. So talking about ecological economics just makes so much sense uh, right now to me. So, so this event, it's a very interesting to me from that angle because systems thinking, it's really, I think should be called the ecosystem thinking. And so ecological systems. So thank you, David and, and Peter for organizing this. Thanks, Joanne. Bruce, say hi. Uh, good afternoon or good evening. Um, this is my first time joining your session. Um, my background is engineering. And while I was doing my engineering masters, I took some economics courses and I've been working with systems ever since. Um, my first introduction to economics from a systems perspective was at the Office for National Statistics in the UK where I led a program upgrading the, uh, the way the national accounts and balance of payments were made. So that gave me an inside view of how the numbers are crunched, which was quite fascinating. Um, and then I attended a presentation at the Oxford Martin School in Oxford where Kate Rayworth was giving a talk on donut economics. And that was in 2018. And since then, I've kind of adopted a number of the models that are in her book, which includes a bit of systems thinking and um, her new alternative way of looking at economics. However, I've been digging into the embedded economy model and as I did, I realized that that was an ecological economics model. So I've been working with that to understand the systems that are creating all the problems we have today on the earth. And it's been a great model to use, but I've, I'm here to hear from the ecological economics point of view, how, how it actually works. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Doug. Hi, Doug Ostrom from Indianapolis, and I am not an economist. I don't pretend to play one on TV or in real life. Um, I'm primarily interested in the relationship, in, increasingly interested in the relationship between social systems, natural systems, and how the principles and premises of natural systems should better inform our social systems, uh, especially around notions of mutualism and exchange of value. So. Thanks, so Doug. Uh, Sama. All right, I'm on the phone now. Can you guys hear me? Yes, can't hear you. It's good, Dave. <laughs> That'll work. New laptop. <laughs> David, I need to get you to come fix it for me. Well, I don't know we'll anything about computers. Yeah, we'll come back. We'll fix, fix on that sometime. Uh, Sama, say hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sama Kamamaz, and um, I'm a current student in the Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program at Bilka. Um I wasn't there in the beginning of the meeting, but I'm assuming um, the question was how much we know about, about ecological economics. And um, my background is in architecture, so um, this term is quite new to me, and uh, I'm happy to be in this session to learn more. Great. Thanks. Rick? I just happened to discover this uh, by chance, and um was, was um, attracted by the notion of ecological economics. I remember reading a book 
I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, talking about, I think it was called green capitalism. And it talked about the, uh, the antithesis to uh, plan obsolescence of having a circular economy where there was no ownership of goods and the producers uh, had to be responsible for the whole life cycle of, of its whatever it was producing. Uh, and so they were built to last and you had to rent or lease products uh, rather than own them, which is a rather interesting idea. Anyway, that's why I'm showing up. I wanna see what uh, people are talking about in terms of ecological economics. I'm Rick and I'm done speaking. Great, thank you. Uh, Dan, say hi. Hi everyone, good to see people. I, I remember Doug from his uh, social technical systems presentation, that was quite good for me. And some of the other people here that I haven't seen for a while, Chris, including Chris. In any case, I know zip about ecological economics. I'm going to learn a lot today, I suspect. So thank you. <clears throat> Great, thanks. So I am pleased to introduce uh, Katie Kish. Um, she can explain a little bit. The, uh, so Katie and David have both um, moved on in their academic careers. And so it's hard to keep up with them sometimes and figure out where they are. But I see officially she's with uh, the York Footprint Initiative and with the uh, Haida Gwaii Institute at UBC. And David is still at York. So I'm going to turn it over to Katie and David and do what you will. Great. Thank you so much. I, um, yeah, my name is Katie Kish and yes, I do work for the York Footprint Initiative. That's my primary job right now and the Global Footprint Network. Um, we make the accounts at York now. That may be something that people don't know that York uh, won the bid to house the footprint accounts, which is a massive amount of data. So I work there now and yeah, I lecture at the Haida Gwaii Institute as well. Um, I know nothing about economics, uh, maybe even less than nothing. I, uh, and I know a little bit more about ecological economics. Um, and I didn't actually prepare an introduction to ecological economics. Um, I'm, it's, I guess, because there's, you can just dive into such a deep hole with ecological economics. Um, and so it's best to just say, basically, in traditional economics, the environment is an externality. It's not included. It's not considered. Whereas ecological econ economists, they start there. Uh, they start with the environment and the economy is embedded in it. And so it's these embedded systems of the economy within society, within the environment. So it's not only a healthy relationship between the flows, between the economy and the environment that they're concerned about, but also that there's good human well-being uh, as, a, as a product of that relationship. And it's really defined on its focus on nature as a starting point on justice as the, sort of, as the social realm, and then time on long time periods and looking back into time to see what we can learn there. So uh, Dave, I, I messaged him and I said, oh, I didn't, I didn't uh, plan anything to, to say what is ecological economics. And he says that he will, uh, he will put the dots together and he's a very good dot putter together. So he will do that for you. Uh, our plan is that I'm going to talk just a little bit about um, why we're here, what we did, what Dave and I wrote recently that grabbed some attention, and um, we'll talk about that. And then in the second half, we're going to move into talking about the research agenda and the most forefront research in ecological economics and some of the patterns that are there uh, that we're noticing. And that relates to this paper that we'll talk about. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions or anything, please just please just interrupt me. Uh, I'm I'm very casual, so that would be that would be totally fine. Uh, Dave, do you want to introduce yourself before I start talking? Sure. Hi everybody. Uh, how's the audio? I have my phone in front of me. Can you hear me reasonably? All right. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. All right. <laughs> Uh, so my name is David Mallory. I'm a, a sixth year PhD candidate at. Uh, what used to be the Faculty of Environmental Studies at York University, which I, I, I currently am at you know, York University. If you can't tell, I'm not in a federal penitentiary or anything. Um, it's, um, so yes, I'm a sixth year PhD candidate. Um, I, I have taught for the faculty. Um, uh, I taught a fourth year course in ecological economics, which we were just discussing. 
I'm currently teaching a second year course um, that is called Economics for the Anthropocene, which is named after a PhD training course that um, both Katie and I were involved in. I was a student fellow in, the, in Economics for the Anthropocene, and Katie was a postdoctoral researcher. Um, and uh, so, so both of those courses uh, engage with um, uh, traditional economics, environmental economics, um, ecological economics, political economy, uh, and uh, political ecology. I, so my, my research um, is sort of all over the place. There's two aspects to it. Uh, on the one hand, um, I, I, I've studied uh, various biophysical accounting systems, uh, such as material and energy flow analysis, um, exergy analysis, uh, the ecological footprint, uh, and, and the one that I, I mainly focus on is called um, multi-scale integrated analysis of social and ecological metabolism, um, which is uh, associated with the Autonomous University in Barcelona and Mario G. And Pietro. Um, uh, the sort of less practical but more epistemological aspect of my work uh, revolves around um, work of uh, Robert Rosen and relational complexity theory. And so I, I, I kind of come at um, the issue of ecological economics from those two angles. On, on the one hand, uh, biophysical accounting methods, uh, and on the other hand, um, the issue of epistemological complexity uh, and how that impacts um, what makes for a less reductionistic or I ideally anti-reductionistic methods for, um, for conducting ecological economics. So uh, I, I want to thank David for having us here, and I want to mention that in part David um, uh, is, is a little bit responsible uh, for this paper because this paper um, largely focuses on the application of critical systems theory to, um, to ecological economics. And uh, I hadn't had much experience with critical systems theory when I started my second comprehensive study on it. And David actually gave me a lot of the, 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 the starting materials for what would go into this paper later on. So I didn't know, I didn't know if you knew that, David, or maybe you, you did or didn't pick up on it. Okay. Nope, so had Katie, no idea. Want, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, All right, Dave. So Katie, if, if you want to start with the presentation. Yeah, sure. So uh, I, again, I don't have slides. I was mentioning before everybody got here that I'm slided out. Uh, I'm just so done with presentations right now, looking at them. It's just been, there's been too many over the last year. And so uh, I'm just going to talk a little. And um, I didn't say where what I did. I said I don't know anything about economics. I'm a sociologist. Um, I'm an environmental sociologist. That's where I'm coming from. Uh, and, and most of my training since my master's has been in systems thinking. <coughs> so um, that's why I don't think I would ever consider myself an economist, but I guess I would consider myself an ecological economist. Uh, so we sent out a whole bunch of papers to you. You were given access to, I think, like almost 40 papers or something. Um, and we're going to focus uh, first on the one that Dave and I published together. It's mine and Dave's name. And then there's a string of, of other names behind us. And we'll explain why that happened. Um, and Dave and I, again, we come out of this program, Economics for the Anthropocene, and it was just, I remember the first time I ever saw Dave giving a presentation, I texted Martin Bunch and I asked, is Dave Mallory one of yours? Because just the way he spoke, uh, I could just tell that he was coming from York and coming from this, this systems family that we have here. Uh, and so ever since then, we've just really liked working together and we try and find excuses to do that. And so the, the motivation for the paper that we're talking about here uh, and where we begin in it is really that it kind of bothers both of us that ecological economics comes out of systems theory and no one really acknowledges that to any great degree. They might say it here and there, but um, we reiterate in the paper that given the complexity of the problems that ecological economics is, is working with, that we need to be able to think in systems. And that to some degree, uh, this has become ingrained in how many ecological economists think to the point where they see interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity as usual. Uh, like Joanne was saying, for ecological economists, it is ecosystems thinking. And so it's just, it's just naturally the way that they approach things, which is really good. 
but it's also not great uh, because it leads to some kind of careless or haphazard use of systems theories and systems languages. And so it becomes more like lip service than as a, than rather like an actual integration. They're not using systems methodologies. They're not um, using some of the tools that could help them work through these problems using using systems. So that bothered us. So because of that, we decided to run a, a workshop to teach a group of the people from E4A uh, about critical systems heuristics, which was what, what Dave Mallory brought, and soft systems methodology, which is what I wanted to teach them because it's my favorite. So we both kind of picked our favorites and they happened to go well together. And so we would, decided we would train these students on how to use it. So we just we thought we would do that uh, through some action research uh, that we would train them on the use of it, and then that they would apply the methodology to a real world problem in the second workshop. So the first workshop, which was meant to be a training workshop, um, we it became very very clear very early on that there was no possible way we were going to be able to apply this to a real world problem in the second workshop. Uh, we had some of the participants from our real world organization that we were connecting with. Uh, and just the way that we were engaging with one another, it was just really clear that we, it was just the wrong approach. We didn't understand the community. There was not a deep enough relationship there. It would have been too rushed. So with a couple of weeks, uh, we redesigned the second workshop to instead we would teach the students um, how to use, they, so they learned the fundamental, fundamentals of critical systems heuristics and soft systems methodology. They learned, they saw them, we walked through it and that they would learn it really deeply by doing a study on them about the state of ecological economics. We had to pick a problem that they all knew intimately well. And if there's anything that people within a discipline love to do, it's to complain about their own discipline. And so we thought that would be a really easy place to start. And it, it was, it worked really well. Um, I was really, I was really surprised how well it worked. Um, so in the second one, we used uh, the second workshop, we used SSM and critical systems heuristics to have the students think through our, our own discipline. And they, we started, we went through the, the soft systems methodology steps. If you're unfamiliar with the method, it's a very iterative um, methodology where you create a problem statement and then you work with the community in sort of a systems world where you're looking at root definitions of where people are coming from. You're making mental models of and mental maps of the problem. And then you take those lessons learned back out into the real world and you just kind of go through the cycle. Uh, there's a diagram of it in, in the paper. Um, and so we we started with the problem definition and they they had three overarching problematic areas with ecological economics. I don't think any of them surprised Dave or I. Um, the first is that there's interdisciplinary struggles. I mean, everyone is kind of dealing with that. The second was that the word economics in the discipline title too narrowly defines the real work conducted or it's too narrowly understood. So they don't want to be pinned as economists because it's so much more than economy, it's, it's livelihood. Uh, that's uh, one of our, the founders of the discipline, Herman Daly, he always drew on that and called it a livelihood discipline, um, but that, that's been lost a little bit. And then the third is that there was insufficient attention to power. And uh, this, is, this again was not very surprising and you'll see why as I, as I keep walking through this. So then we moved on to the root definitions, which is usually where you would use this mnemonic cat woe where you define this, the problem. Um, but instead we use critical systems heuristics, the questions where there's um, eight sets of questions, I think, Dave will, Dave will correct me. Um, there's probably, there's, uh, and then within each of those categories, there's another eight to 10 questions within them. So we went through all of those. And again, in the paper, there's a very long table where we do all the point form of their answers, where we put those together. And actually we ran out of time. So that's why their names are on the paper. It's kind of a weird thing to have participants publish with you. And we had to put a big um, sort of caveat at the beginning uh, that basically we ran out of time, but we wanted their input still. So they filled all of that out afterwards. And really there was this great attention to power, non-human beings, inclusivity and knowledge legit legitimation, um, which you know, we see a lot in ecological economics now in the new generation. So that's one, oh, sorry, that's one thing that was implicit in what I was saying. So we were training these ecological economists. Uh, they were students, they were emerging ecological economists. They were not established ecological economists. So there was no one who, the, the discipline's been around for 30 years. These are all people who have been in the discipline for um like five years maximum if that um <clears throat> and so it was really 
that's this is really representative of new ecological economists. So then we went in and we used a collaborative tool called Miro online, where you can go. I don't know if any of you have used it. If you like to do systems mapping, um, yeah, I saw some hands. If you like to do systems mapping and you're stuck online, it's a really, really good tool for doing collaborative work. I do re really recommend it. It's I've used it in a few different instances and it really works well. So we use Miro to identify some key feedback loops. Um, some of the ones they identified were that the journal is a main source of knowledge legit legitimation and that that bothers them a great deal, that outside actors are really necessary for real world action, but that the gap between academia and the real world is still very wide or too wide, and that there's insufficient integration of social and natural sciences together. They're still quite disparate. So even though it's an interdisciplinary discipline, um, there's still a split. The social ecological economists still kind of stick together, whereas the biophysical ecological economists, they stick together, and the energy ecological economists, they all stick together. So it still gets fragmented. Um, so overall, we saw this really interesting pattern, which, uh, Again, there's a table, and I'm just going to, if I can, pop this open. <clears throat> oh, of course, I've lost it. It's on the lot. There it is. It's on the last page. So we came up with this, this table. Um, uh, the first five columns are from Jackson and he built on it from some early sociological work that was done. And I'm just going to look at the last two columns to discuss the patterns that we started to see with this emerging generation of ecological economists. So the first is that the basic goal has switched from just reclaiming conflict to a really big focus on repairing relations. The methods uh, they've transformed into the, an interest in reflexivity and relational complexity. Their hope, they, it's no longer just looking for uh, a space for lost voices, and they, they've found those voices. These voices have been found, they are loud, and now they want to use those voices to dismantle dominant regimes that maintain power, uh, and then they want to rebuild. The organizational metaphor, we kind of, we struggled with this one a little bit, but we were both pretty pleased with ourselves when we came up with adjacent possible. Um, ecological economists are always looking, uh, or new ecological economists are always looking for a new sort of prefigurative option. They're trying to build lots of different options. They see hope in, in different futures and they have no idea which one will fall into, but they'd like to strengthen the one, the pieces of them that they want as much as possible so that we might fall into a good one. The problems addressed have moved from marginalization and conflict su suppression into fragmented ecologies and intergenerational trauma. And that's very, very present. The narrative style is no longer ambivalent. It's very imaginative. Uh, the time identity is not postmodern anymore. It's more of a post-normal uh, identity with time where to some extent time doesn't really matter. Um, and it's more about the uh, urgency of the problems within the time that we're in. And so it's very, it's very post-normal in that way. The organizational benefits move from diversity and creativity to relationality and coevolution. A big part of ecological economics as a discipline is that it's really interested in how the systems of economy, environment, and society co-evolve together over time and how we can make that a mutually flourishing relationship. And uh, it's also prefigurative, as I mentioned before. The mood is no longer playful, it's motivated, and the social fear is not totalitization, it's fascism and nihilism. So this is the table that we uh, that we came up with coming out of that uh, out of those workshops and um, I'm gonna just stop. Let's, uh, I just want to pause there actually for a second oh, because okay. I, there's a that that table um, is a lot <laughs> and it, it's really really important um, because most people will not have been familiar with Jackson um, and so. We might want to pause and actually step through that a little bit and and describe why it's important to have those different perspectives and understand where people are coming from. Sure. Um, so just yeah. put a link to the paper in the chat because um, I know that Dave's going to want to talk about it. Uh, and so this way, I, I I won't put it back up. It's on the very last page of um, text in the paper. Um, and so you can look through it oops, on your own. And uh, yes, to Chris, adjacent possible is from is from Stuart Kaufman, which again, that was one of the first things Dave and I bonded over was our 
mutual adoration of Stuart Kaufman. So, Dave, do you want to talk to the talk to that table? Yeah, so I mean, the table will help us to put it into context, um, which you began talking about. Um, so the important thing, uh, because everyone here doesn't really have a background in, in ecological economics, and it's a very interesting discourse, it's not, ecological economics is considered heterodox economics in that it rejects the, uh, the dominant sort of orthodox or neoclassical uh, economic theory, um, primarily uh, in terms of macroeconomics. Right, regression analysis, gross domestic product, and these sorts of things. Um, not microeconomics. Nobody really argues with microeconomics, supply and demand, things like that. That's fine. That, that's basically how it works. Ecological economics reject things like the, the circular flow of income or like um, 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 diminishing marginal uh, utility, neoclassical assumptions that weren't necessarily in classical economics. Um, and the ecological economics is heterodox, but it's not standardized, right? So behavioral economics has standardized methods. Keynesian economics has standardized methods. A lot of heterodox fields do. Ecological economics tends not to. And ecological economists come from different fields. Obviously, ecological economists come from ecology, theoretical ecology primarily, and that's where systems theory by and large enters ecological economics, not so much social system theory. Social system theory does not really penetrate ecological economics as much as perhaps they, they ought to realize or, or be attentive to. Um, so we have ecologists on the one hand, we have economists as well, uh, and then there's political economy, right? Uh, which tends to be a, a separate field called political ecology uh, and so this creates basically three groups um, that feud with each other. Um, and, and, and there's tensions between these different fields. And so Katie and I having backgrounds, and I, I have a background in political theory, Katie has a background in sociology, realizing that clearly economists and ecologists um, coming to this field don't have a very strong understanding of, of different paradigms in social thought. And so that's what that um, that's what that uh, the the chart that Katie just put up um, from Jackson um, was addressing. And and so to me and 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 Katie and I discussed this and we agreed on it is is that um, ecological economics is trying to be this pluralistic transdiscipline, uh, but the criticism is always that like we've created this big tent but it's a big tent full of antagonists with opposing ontologies, right? And that, in a nutshell, describes systems theory as well. Uh, and that's something that systems theory has had to contend with since, since basically the beginning. And that's, a, that's in large part what critical systems theory was developed to address. Um, not necessarily for any one of those groups to gain dominance, but to think about how bridges can be drawn between them, how to create a space of not uncritical pluralism, but critical pluralism, whereby everyone is aware of their worldviews, their assumptions, their ontological commitments, their epistemological um, assumptions, and, and, and their methodological assumptions as well. Um, be aware of the incongruence between them. And with that awareness, you can work with this kind of ethos of pluralization from there. And so that's where this paper came from, is this idea that like, as long as we can get people to the point where they understand what they're disagreeing about, and they understand how really firmly rooted assumptions that are, that are really you know, just reenacting um, arguments in social theory that have happened for a long time, um, then we might have a chance at having pluralism instead of what we think of as unproductive, maybe productive is the wrong word here, but the unproductive uh, antagonism towards each other. Um, so the shift, the idea of the shift here is towards agonism, which is like, you know, um, struggle, but not antagonism. Right? It's a kind of productive struggle that something comes out of. It. Um, so, in our estimation, systems theory has managed that fairly well. Uh, and, and I would say 
better than a lot of other trans disciplines, or at least they created uh, the critical systems theorists in critical system heuristics or in boundary analysis, and Gerald Midgley, uh, have, have created the conditions where that can happen. So that, that chart and the other charts that we have in the article um, are trying to assist people in locating themselves and their assumptions in the broader history of different paradigms in social theory. But, yeah. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Okay. Let, 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 let me let me suggest getting concrete. So so as an okay. example, a, a functionalist perspective, like any almost any business is a functionalist perspective. Um because almost that's, any what? Sorry, David, my, my yeah, name. almost any business. Yeah. Yeah. Um and uh, but then we get into uh, uh an interpretive model, which would be no, you know, that may be more um I hate to say social work, sociology, sort of understanding what's going on. Um, and uh, um, emancipatory. Um, then we start getting into, I hate to say the Marxists, but you know, people are saying that, uh, you know, that the systems that are oppressing us. Um, and so uh, I, I think it's important. It, it's, it's one of the more important ideas and it's, it's really valuable, but it, at the same time, it's hard to stand back and think where you're coming from, um, and and recognizing that in other uh, in other views. And so, uh, I think it's worth discussing a little more if uh, if people want to speak up about it and what they kind of get or don't get about it. And if I can just say for a minute that you know to say functional to say functionalist is like any business, saying that's actually a really good way to think about what's different because it's. Uh, it's like any neoclassical capitalist business, absolutely. But an ecological economist, they would want their business to be part of repairing relations with indigenous peoples. They would want their business to, um, to feed into the adjacent possible that they are interested in prefiguring. They would want their business, it doesn't need to be productive or efficient. It can be totally unproductive and totally inefficient, like a tool library is not it's not making a lot of money. It's not particularly efficient, but that's what they want. They want to see sharing. They want to see relationality. They want to see co-evolution. They want to see the business evolve alongside the needs of the community. So it's you, you can use something like a business to work through the two to see the differences between those two paradigms. And it's worth noting, it was, it was a good example, David, that, to say that a business is functionalist because all of neoclassical economics is functionalist. Uh, and and this was the um, this was what we were tiptoeing around, and this is why we had to do it like this, is because so was ecology, uh, and and so it, there's an interesting um, relationship between economics and ecology, and for one, is etymological. They're, they're both um, they're both the study of the maintenance of the home, right? That's what eco means, right? And and so. Um, and they they actually use similar methods in in, in that the, or the similar mathematics in for example um, partial difference equations and things like that. Um, a lot of their epistemological assumptions are common, and so um, the what we were trying to introduce into, into ecological economics was not just this idea that like they should maybe be critical of what our what would be obvious to any other field is that they're making functionalist statements, but also to open them up to social systems theory, um, which has been conscious of structural functionalism and trying to move beyond structural functionalism for a long time. I think Rick has a question. Yeah, I do. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm just doing some sense making here, and I was wondering if you would uh, mind sort of elaborating on the last two features, mood and social fear, and talking through the um, features you've listed for the different domains um, by talking through it so that I can understand how those two features like optimistic and disorder pertain to the functionist perspective and friendly depersonalizing. Because obviously a ton of work has gone into this sort of inductive categorization. And the thing about 
coming across something that you're not familiar with uh, as you can't make sense of it uh, without reading the article. So could you give a sort of like a Reader's Digest summary of the, you know, the two features for each of the different domains as it relates to mood and social fear? Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm just looking for the chart. There it is. Okay. Oh, I see. My my immediate reaction is is yes and and yes but. <laughs> uh, so when it, I be, it, yeah, you know when I see functionalist and you're talking about um, you know the. Uh, the, what you were just talking about, it was like, well, is it optimistic all the time or is, is it disorder? I mean, so, you know, obviously, I mean, these are, you know, categorizations and they obviously have, you know, some exceptions to them, but just the reason for stereotyping in the way that you have. Yeah, so it, it's most of this chart was uh, done by uh, Michael C. Jackson. He was a uh, I can't remember when he was the president of the IEEE, but I, I think he was within the last 20 years or so. Um, so, I, I and so for for his characterization of these um, of these uh, paradigms in social thought, I, I can try to justify it. Um, the mood of functionalism, you might call optimistic. Um, I would use a different term there, which would be progressive, um, but not nearly in the sense that we use the term progressive in, in political discourse today. Um, the idea of, of um, the progressive um, evolution um, entered into sort of the, the scientific consciousness and around the period that structural functionalism did as well. So the, the father of structural functionalism was Herbert Spencer. Uh, is everyone familiar with Spencer? Spencer was like, a, you know, he was probably the most famous scientist in the world at that time. Um, Darwin was like a, a very small blip on the radar compared to Herbert Spencer. Um, and, and in fact, it was Spencer who coined the term survival of the fit. Darwin did not use that term. That was Herbert Spencer who, who created the idea of survival of the fittest. And, and Spencer's idea, um, Spencer wrote both um, the sort of uh, the principles of biology and ecology um, and the principles of sociology. So he was sort of a founding father in both of those fields. And he extended um, the, the idea of evolution to social systems. Uh, and so that's where this idea of social Darwinism, which should have been called social Spencerism, really, because it was his idea, uh, originated. Um, and this is where the idea of progressive evolution and also holism originated. And so for Spencer, conceiving of a society was conceiving of something that had, um, uh, that had distinct boundaries. Um, and it was a whole that was made up of smaller functional components. Um, and this idea is something that you, you see frequently in systems theory as well, which is part of what Michael C. Jackson was trying to uh, discuss was um, to what extent does do different um, expressions of systems theory actually draw from structural functionalism. Now, structural functionalism was the dominant sociological school for most of the history of sociology. Um, up until the early to mid 20th century, uh, when Max Weber and, and interpretive sociologists emerged, uh, they were very rapidly engaged by the uh, critical theorists of the Frankfurt School. Uh, and that sort of segued into post structuralism and modernism. Um, so the the mood in structural functionalism and, and the disorder is um, this idea that holes have integrity, uh, but they are also um, systems that evolve in a sort of uh, progressive trajectory. Uh, and they, they get increasingly complex over time, uh, and that's a good thing. So that's, that's how I would characterize 
Uh, and if um, I can just, oh, sorry. I was going to say a really, I mean, easy kind of way of answering that question is that, um, I mean, yeah, whenever you put things in a chart and try to place people in it, there's going to be a mess and people are going to you know, take issue. But the, the idea of the mood was is meant to represent the body or the foundation of, of cooperation, how the how people approach cooperating with others or their relationships with others. Um, that's what mood was supposed to be. And we, so Dave and I didn't come up with these words. We, we just used, we just added a, a column. And then the other one, social fear is what's threatening that their worldview. So it, with um, the one that we've made here, we said nihilism and fascism. If people just stopped caring, uh, a lot of it would, would crumble. Does that answer your question? Mm. Uh, it I don't raises, oh, hey, Rick. Well, no, sorry. I, well, for me, at least. Oh, hello, Peter. I didn't realize it was Peter Jones there. Good to see you. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, it, you know, it, it, the, 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 re, the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm just bringing it up is, is just from a sense-making perspective, and that is how to, um, you know, th these are sort of, um, uh, th these are somewhat nebulous things, and you're trying to, sort of characterize distinctions. And um, so that's, that's why I'm, um, you know, just trying to sort of, um, some respects, decode and understand better uh, the uh, intentionality of the categories. So it, 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 this is not something that, I mean, it takes time to assimilate this. But I, I just, I was hoping to give a high level sort of summary of, of the essence of it in such a way that you would get the gist of it, but then could do a deep dive into it later. Well, uh, I'd like to, to kind of extend the, the discussion just a little bit on this with respect to the um, uh, economic behavior, even micro macro in some of these categories. Because one of the ways that we look at the progression of the, the different um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, bodies of or movements of systems thinking and systems theory that supports these, these movements is that they followed culture and they followed academic and theoretical movements that were occurring at the same time as David was, was suggesting. But we still are in a postmodern era right now too. And so there is there a conflict between kind of the postmodern milieu that we're in, which actually is dealing with totalization and globalization and global monopol monopolies and in a postmodern attitude, they don't necessarily see that as bad. I mean, they should, but that's the problem with postmodernism, I think, is you know, you can be playful in an Amazon world. But the regenerative orientation would would be, especially if you're looking at mood motivated and con contra to fascism. Fascism is a, is corporatism essentially. It's fusion in the corporate and state for corporate goals using oppressive means. And so there's a way in which, you know, postmodernism and, and regenerative could be in conflict uh, if we really look at it. And I think we're in a postmodern world with some of us moving towards regenerative and, and others, I would say, David, like the GAIN project, um, not maybe it so much, but Bounce Beyond is definitely, look, I mean, we're drawing on regenerativity to a great extent, but it's transformative and it's orientation. And that's another, I think another direction that, that needs to be, will, will, might, could be another column in the future. And anti-corporate, see that? So I'm saying about regenerative and, and even transformative. It's post-corporate, anti-corporate and post-modern is pro-corporate. In, in a big way, and yeah, much more than we think it is. Well, it's, you know, the, there's, there's distinctions with, within each of these fields as well. I, I think um, right now we're, we're in, we're in a very curious position uh, with respect to social paradigms and in, in particular how they relate to the philosophy of science and um, claims to truth. 
so on the one hand, you know, as the last year showed us, we're very much in a post-truth world. Um, and that's, to some extent, um, uh, a symptom of being in a post-normal scientific mode. Um, we, and, and, and I think that um, the complexity of the problems that we're facing and the kind of problems that ecological economics tries to address um, brings that to light. Um, there are no simple ways of characterizing um, complex problems. Um, and so the, the need for uh, a pluralistic orientation to address or, or, or to just try and wrap our heads around this is clear, um, but that also creates this vulnerability for um, trying to make any kind of uh, statements to truth. So climate change is a good example of this. Um, on the one hand, like we, we know that climate change is happening, but we don't know how exactly it's going to happen. We don't know how it's going to play out. We know that we understand the physical processes very well, but we don't know understand exactly how those physical processes, once they interface with these nested set of complex systems from human societies to ecosystems to humans ourselves, um, are going to work. So, um, so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to move beyond um, what we see as being an unproductive antagonism between these four sort of groups um, and trying to get some groups to assert themselves um, and some groups to sort of draw back on certain claims. I haven't been paying attention to the chat. What's going on over here? It's uh, not, not, not relevant, not related. <laughs> although, although I think um, on, on time, I think we'll I'll invite Bruce because he's been typing a lot to ask whether he has some comments. Um, then we should switch over to the other topic. Um, Bruce? Uh, <clears throat> no comments, just carry on. So I've been getting answers to the questions. <laughs> um, I, I have, Bruce, if I can get your email, I can send you some really cool diagrams and images about the different ways that people, that ecological economists think about the government because it's surprisingly divisive. Um, but, I, so I'll, I'll pull us back a little bit, and this leads into the next topic anyway, about what this actually means uh, for ecological economics. Um, the, the list, the vast list of papers that you were provided with, um, that was a, they are, they're all part of this research agenda. Uh, so ecological economics has been around for 30 years. There's a bit of a changing of the guard right now where a lot of the older ecological economists are retiring and the new ecological economists are getting the jobs. And so it was kind of time to rewrite what the priorities of the discipline were. And so this, this division or this new, this, I mean, there's not necessarily a, the division isn't clear, but there is some indication that the newer generation have this different approach and we're trying to get them to step forward a little bit more and, and, uh, grab onto that and be, you know, vocal about it. Uh, and so there's a bunch of papers in that research agenda. Um, there's one by Joe Amont on ecological monetary theory. There's one by um, Sam Bliss and Meg Egler on um, non-market food systems. There's one by Jeff Garver on ecological law. There's one from um, uh, Sophia Sanidi and Sarah Louise Ruder on predatory ontologies, they call it, but it's really about ecofeminism in ecological economics. There is one from, um, from a group from E4A all about education in the Anthropocene. So the pattern here is that they're much bigger, broader topics. Whereas if you switch focus and you look at what Herman Daly submitted, it's a list of 10 very specific questions. Or you look at what Bob Costanza submitted and it's a list of very specific things he thinks should be engaged with. Um, Peter, Peter Victor opted not to, to contribute. Uh, he did to the books. There was a, there was a book also, um, I had a copy of it somewhere, but it's Bob Costanza wrote it and 
that has a lot of the big names in it. The point of the journal issue, journal uh, issues was to get different names involved and to get the voices of the, of the younger generation uh, heard because they're not in, they're very few of them are in the book. So you see this, this split of interest. And so whether that's in, because, you know, some might attribute that to the fact that many ecological economists who are just newly trained like myself and Dave have never taken an economics course in our life. So of course our work isn't gonna have any economics in it. Um, others would say, well, that's probably the best possible thing because the way that I think about production and that's what my work is on, it's on production and, and localized production is very different from an economist because I've never been trained as an economist. But it creates this divide. Um, and it, it makes them kind of angry, uh, some of them. So when we put this issue out, we of course emailed it to our um, to our mentors and asked, so what do you think? And some of the funny ones that stood out was um, Peter, Peter Victor said he had to stop reading one um, in despair because it was just, he couldn't, couldn't do it. So he quit reading in despair. Um, another Peter told me that there was not an ounce of economics in anything that was written by anyone who had graduated in the last five years. Um, another Peter, Peter what? Is that Peter Brown? Of course it was Peter Brown. Um, <laughs> uh, and then that same Peter, <laughs> he uh, took a very direct hit at one of at my paper which uh, was in the sustainability issue on advertising to say that there was, that the way that I had approached advertising was so far removed from ecological economics that there was no way any ecological economist, and he thought even my peers, uh, that they would, they would have no way of, of responding to it or engaging with it. So this, this, so there's a there's a there's a dual problem here that that, that um, those Peters are still the ones teaching us. So we're the but these new problems that were very big, very broad. They need systems theory. They need systems approaches. They need systems methodologies. And so part of our question of of, um, of talking to people about this is is you know how do we fix that gap? What what does that gap look like? Uh, and how do we how do we bridge it? Um, <clears throat> I lost my train of Nick, thought. Sorry, go ahead. Nick has a good question here. Where, oh. here. Sorry, Nick has a good question here where he's saying, can we summarize the similarities and differences between old and new ecological economics? So uh, the way I would characterize this is that like foundational ecological economics started to coalesce around like the 1970s and like the, the oil shock, right? This is when people really, and limits to growth, things like that. This is when people started to think about the limits to growth. Uh, the idea that there are hard and fast biophysical limits, right? Um, and so the the early ecological economists were thinking in terms of sustainable scale. What's the optimal scale of human um, of human economies situated within a broader admissible context, which is the biosphere, right? Uh, and the way that they articulated it back then is saying that we have three main concerns. And some of these we borrow from economics and some of these we, we oppose economics. And they were saying the issue, the, the three pillars of ecological economics is sustainable scale, efficient allocation, um, and just distribution. Um, the foundational ecological economics had those things in the hierarchy of saying sustainable scale is primary. Secondary is efficient allocation, and the third is just distribution. Um, and that's something that's not, not acceptable to many of the younger ecological economists. We don't see those things as preconditions one for another for another. We think that those things can be ordered in any sequence depending on the context. And in general, we think that you know having them in, in, in a hierarchical sequence like that probably doesn't make any sense. And so in the younger generation, what we see is that like you, you don't see statements like um, sustainable scale is a precondition for just distribution. You could just as easily say that just distribution is a precondition for sustainable scale, right? We can't have 
sustainability unless we begin to address resource distribution conflict um, in, in what we would call the developing world. Um, so, yeah. And, Does that answer and, your question? Well, and part of that also comes from, uh, there, it's not just a, a ideological change, it's a, a, a makeup change as well. So where the discipline, if you look at, uh, if you, there's a guy who wrote a paper, I can't remember the name of it right now, but he looked at the whole history of the Journal of Ecological Economics. The top 10 authors were all white men. Uh, we held a 2018 symposium. It was more than half women and it was more than half uh, persons of color. Uh, and it was, we were from 11 different uh, countries across the globe no one had taken an economics class and so it's this totally different makeup of people as well and so that's why you get this this focus rick yeah yeah i'd just like to dovetail on something you just said david in terms of the distinction because i think when people start putting priorities and hierarchies in to me that strikes me as being sort of reductionistic linear logarithmic type thinking which is antithetical to complexity thinking, systems thinking. And it's I, yeah, I and it better to think of a constellation of, of whatever it is, whether it's virtues or values, and thinking it's context dependent, and how can it be most dependent to the context depending upon the outcomes you're aspiring to? Does that make sense? Yeah, so there are multiple genealogies at the beginning of ecological economics, uh, and, and of those, 10 sort of main papers that Kitty was mentioning. Um, it'll become apparent how this relates to systems theory. Um, Herman Daly, who, who approaches ecological economics from a more or less economic perspective, was a student of Nicolas Trukowski Rogan, who, who was a brilliant economist. I won't get into him. Um, Charles Hall and Robert Costanza, who were both also foundational ecological economists, were both students of Howard T. Odom. Uh, and Richard Norgard, who's another sort of uh, significant foundational ecological economist, one of his mentors was um, Kenneth Boulding. So that gives you an idea of why we say that ecological economics is intimately related to systems theory. It either came from Boulding or it was coming from Odom. Um, and Odom, there's a lot of good things to be said about Odom and theoretical ecology, but it was reductionist. Um, it was energy reduction like that, and that early ecological economics bears those hallmarks. Um, and a lot of those ideas, and it was also it was also what um, critical systems theorists would characterize as functional. Uh, and that is problematic for a lot of the younger uh, people going into uh, ecological economics who are very interested in uh, and social and environmental justice, um, because they tend to come from more critical and post-structural backgrounds. And this is, this is why there, there's an overlap between ecological economics and a related field called political ecology. And political ecology um, was, um, is basically, ecolo uh, sorry, it, it's political economy of the environment. Um, and it grew out of, um, it, it grew out of sociologists and political theorists opposing people like uh, Roy Rappaport, right? Who wrote Pigs for the Ancestors and, and the sort of the application of ecological thinking to social theory that was happening in the 60s and 70s. So political ecology is deeply anti-functionalist as well. Um, so what we were trying to do was help people to sort of locate themselves in, in these longer, older threads of, of social research and understand how um, these uh, incongruent sort of ideas ha have been in conflict for a long time. Um, but yes, I, I, I agree with you that the, the sort of foundational ideas, putting things in the hierarchy, uh, was reductionist. And so what we're proposing is, is trying to get to a way where we can still draw from theoretical ecology, uh, but in a more critical way uh, that doesn't see it as, uh, that doesn't embrace that reductionism 
um, and tries to use what's useful without uh, falling victim to the pitfall. I'd also add, as a former ISSS president, my my uh, mantra was rethinking systems thinking because a lot of the systems thinking that we that we cite today is frozen in the 20th century, and we yeah. do need to change that. Yeah. Well, it, one of the things that's interesting about the critical systems theorists, and and I watched a, I watched a wonderful talk um, with. Uh, Jackson recently, it was, it was a Zoom meeting just like this, where he was discussing beer, where he was discussing Stafford beer. Um, and th there was no part of him that was antagonistic. There was no part of him that, that was saying, like, this isn't something that people should be doing. Um, he, he was just trying to, um, he was just trying to articulate the differences in the worldviews between the different sorts of the different paradigms and systems theory that come into contact um, so that we can figure out a way to get them to work. And this is the system of systems. That's what the system of system of methodologies is for, uh, which is the hallmark of, of Jackson's research. The idea of that wasn't to say, like, um, these expressions of systems theory are bad and these are good. The idea of it was to was so that people could understand the limitation of their methods and concepts in different contexts. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to achieve here. And if you do that, then you can think about how you can choose the right tool for the right problem context, right? This is something that integrated systems theory that's been happening in the last 20 years has focused on. And we're saying we need that sort of critical realism in our field as well. Uh, Rick has asked a question in the in the chat that keeps this conversation going. Uh, what needs to be preserved and deconstructed from the old paradigm, and how will the new EE paradigm help us to co-design and build an equitable region of a sustainable future? So um, I have a an answer to that. That's not. It's one of those answers that not doesn't totally answer, and then Dave will probably answer it afterwards. Um, but I will say that there's a major problem with um, with both with both both the old and the new. Uh, the older in that they did like to order things. It was very linear. They think very linearly. Um, that's just the way they were tra trained. And with the newer group, they are certainly, they certainly do not think linear at all, but it means that they're missing a lot of the tools available to them. Uh, so I don't think, I think out of the group of maybe 50 of us, um, Dave and I know two people who know how to do stock flow modeling. Um, out of the 50 of us, um, I think maybe two or three of us might know how to do uh, work with like with data sets. Uh, and I've just learned like how to use really massive data sets and the ethics around that. Um, and so there's we're losing a lot of these methodologies that came out of old ecological economic old 30 years. I'm I'm older than that, so I'm not going to call it old um, out of the first generation of ecological economics. Um, and so, so it, you know, they need to build this equitable, regenerative, sustainable future, but still keep some of these, um, still keep some of these less lessons and methodologies from from before. Uh, Dave, do you want to? Sorry, my my kids are talking. My kids are saying my name in the background, so I just got distracted. That's why I'm at the office. <laughs> I sent Katie a picture of my desk today and like the setup and how productive I'm being. And I'm saying the one thing that you'll notice that's not on my desk is a toddler, <laughs> because that's what would be happening at home. Um, uh, where are we in the in the chat? Sorry, I, I, I lost the thread. Well, well, David, uh, yeah, I was I thinking think Rick's question might actually connect to your research agenda. Um, you know, yeah. as, as like, what is, where's the agenda going? What is in the new ecological economics as you're seeing it and the role of, of social systems and, and new systems thinking, um, you know, which you've already showed us in the, you know, in, in the table and we've discussed, but, you know, this might also be a good connection to the research agenda. Also with respect to, you know, uh, Costan the Costanza book, which David had shared too. So I'm not able to get those papers yet, so I'm curious about 
you know, your thoughts on the agendas? Well, I think that, um, uh, yeah, unfortunately, the, the pandemic in parenthood has hampered my ability to, to you know, publish and, and put my own thoughts in this. And so I'm putting it all into my dissertation. Um, it, so I think it revolves around the concept of complexity uh, and how we define complexity, because there's a lot of different definitions for complexity. I adopt Robert Rosen's definition of complexity. Um, which is quite simply to say that a system is complex if you can interact with it in a number of non-equivalent ways or describe it in a number of non-equivalent ways. Um, and that is a fundamentally anti-positivist, anti-functionalist orientation. Um, I, I, would, I would say that um, epistemologically, Rosen's concept of complexity inter, you know, it, it, it intersects with um, the latter three of the sociological paradigms, interpretive, post-structural, or, or critical. And it certainly works very well with boundary analysis um, for midgley and critical systems theory. Um, but it's, you know, there, there's two prevailing ways that we think of complexity. One of them is the one that I just described. The other one is this sort of uh, list of characteristics. Um, and in, generally in ecological economics, we use the latter. We use the list of characteristics to say like, complexity is, is, is defined by hierarchies of scale, um, nonlinear loops, emergence, uncertainty. And there's one that I always forget. Um, and I think that that's a problem because it doesn't lend itself to uh, pluralism. And that doesn't lend itself to transdisciplinarity because right now what we have is a number of people coming into the field, as Katie was just explaining, who, who come from these backgrounds that don't think that, who don't believe in a correspondence theory of truth, who are fundamentally anti-positive, who believe that you need multiple perspectives to solve this. And then you have the old guard and the, the younger expressions of the old guard who are saying, you know, we, we need to look at this the way that ecology would. Uh, we need to do biophysical analysis. We need to think of this in terms of the progressive evolutionary models of how societies behave under certain conditions. And I think that those things can't coexist uh, the way that they're trying to right now because one is fundamentally violent towards the other. So I think that we need to understand um, we, we need to be more explicit about our uh, epistemological orientation, and we need to back off of the reductionism or the, the modern day application of what I see as being older, more reductionistic expressions of systems theory, which is not to say that all old forms of systems theory were reductionist, because I don't believe that they were. And I believe that um, for the most part, like systems theorists were, were very much trying to address uh, the issues with reductionism and, and, and structural functionalism and are often misunderstood by social theorists, um, but oftentimes social theorists have a point as well. So what we need to do is we need to, we need to get everyone on the same page uh, and we need to understand how, um, how these conflicts arise due to our ontological commitments and our epistemological assumptions, et cetera. And um, I just want to also say, I think that part of this, the ability to co-design and build an equitable and regenerative and sustainable future is that a lot of people, a lot of ecological economists now, they come to it with a background very similar to mine. And so they're pulling in all of these threads from, you know, they've read a bunch of books from a diff bunch of different disciplines. They're a master of absolutely nothing. Um, and so they pull it all together. And so you get people like there's a paper in the research agenda by, um, oh, what's his name? Oh, shoot. It's the resilience one. He did his master's at uh, Waterloo with Jennifer Clapp. I, I'm not going to remember his name anyway. And it's all about resilience and how, it, how ecological economics needs a fourth pillar of resilience. And a lot of ecological economists, they have this background in resilience, the, the um, panarchy, 
is like a staple in ecological economics. Every ecological economist knows the panarchy cycle and knows that we go through these systems of collapse and rebuild. And so they're oh, so the new generation is always really focused on this rebuild part. And in that rebuilding, they look at the sort of past principles of ecological economics that we want to build on, um, livelihood, um, the, the idea of oikos, that, that it's essentially an economics of the home, um, putting the home back into the center as the focus, um, that well-being is multidimensional, not measured by GDP, um, that just distribution is a central figure to the way that we do that, and that we have to do all of that within planetary boundaries. And then they look at the little pieces that they've learned, you know, by taking a bunch of different introductory courses and they say, well, we can measure benefits, not uh, just by GDP, but, you know, there's these things called ecosystem services. And so they pull that in and they bring in all of these little, little pieces that maybe someone took a stock flow course and they say, well, we focus way too much on the flows when we're essentially concerned about our stocks. And so they want to start to question that, right? Um, or that um, that you, maybe they've taken, um, like, like I did, I took a bunch of religion courses in undergrad. And so we need these non-Western perspectives that focus more on, uh, on balance and, uh, and relationality. And so they're bringing in all of these pieces and hanging on to the best parts of ecological economics and adding in all of these things that they've learned that resonated with them as being hopeful for the future. And um, they're doing that on their own without anybody helping them. And it's really self-organizing. And so I would be, you know, uh, I would be um, hesitant to try and make that happen more because, you know, as soon as you try and make it happen more, it stops. But, um, and I was just gonna say, so then you get Kate Raworth uh, who made Donut Economics, and it's wildly popular. And yeah, she's an ecological economist. She trained under Herman Daly. So you get these, um, these things that really resonate with people because the newer, you know, emerging like Kate or others, like um, Joe, if you read his ecological monetary theory, it's all about the home and about, you know, making sure that we remunerate people based on, you know, livelihood rather than, you know, other things that we value. Um, so you get these new theories that have hung on to the multidimensional well-being, the just distribution, the living within planetary boundaries, but they add in these really thoughtful and deep social boundaries. And so this whole idea of social limits to growth is becoming a lot more popular. Um, Barbara Maraca and somebody else just put out a paper on that exact thing. So I'll stop talking while I find it and put it in the chat. And Dave looked like he had something to say, so. Oh, I didn't. Oh, I can talk. Okay. Well, so, um, yeah, another thing that just to put this paper into sort of context is just a much broader sort of debate that's happening in environmental theory right now. Um, on either side of ecological economics and sort of blending into it from both sides, you have like the Anthropocene discourse, you have the planetary boundaries people, which draw heavily from resilience theory and um, technology, uh, complex adaptive systems. Um, and then on the other hand, you have the people talking about um, resource distribution problems. Um, you can characterize each of those sides by how they look at the issue of limits. Uh, and and how they look at the issue of scale. Uh, on the one side, the planetary boundaries and the Anthropocene discourse, we're, we're saying we're running out, right? We're running out of, there's two ways that you can think about limits. Either we're running out of stuff, peak oil, energy return on investment, um, or, or, or peak everything for that matter, lithium, silver, or whatever, um, or, or the idea of planetary boundaries is that we are disrupting. The second way that you can think about um, limits is that we're we're disrupting uh, the self-organization capacity of the life support systems of the Earth. So on, on the one hand, we're running out of gas to sustain our society. On the other hand, we're running out of road. Right? Those are the two ways that you can conceive of limits. And so you have the people in the Anthropocene discourse talking about limits. We can't do this forever. We can't 
sustain uh, these economies of this scale, this rate of consumption for this long. Right? On the other side of ecological, economic, and political ecology, or more broadly, environmental justice, we have people saying, yes, we can. You know, we can sustain far more people, population is a hot point topic, um, for a very long time if we just consume less or if resources are distributed differently. The problem is that you have these asymmetries in the world system whereby some people are consuming way too much at the expense of everybody else. Right? So you have, on the one hand, a scarcity problem, which is a very typically economic concept, scarcity. And on the other hand, you have abundance that's unrealized. Right? And so these two poles are sort of diametrically opposed to each other. Um, and, and there's a lot of you know, acrimony between them. Uh, and ecological economics has become this arena where those two poles are, are, are duking it out right now. Um, and part of the idea behind this paper is what if both of those things are true concurrently, right? But it just depends on the context. Like, we don't have absolute scarcity and we don't have absolute abundance, but in different contexts, we see one or either, and perhaps both of those things. So um, how do we create a pluralistic space where we can hold both of those thoughts in our head at the same time, where we can think about the fact that um, we're going to, in the future, we're, it's more than likely that we're going to have to do a great deal more with a great deal less. Uh, and on the other hand, we have to do that while we're trying to provide well-being um, to a greater number of people uh, in an equitable way. Right? Those two things don't need to be opposites, but right now they are, and they're going to be opposites unless we create a framework, uh, a pluralistic framework, uh, where people can discuss it. Yeah, and so, and to Bruce's comment, then this is again uh, a pattern you can see in the research agenda and between these two areas of uh, two groups of ecological economists that there's a older guard that would, you know, they approach it with global governance and governance strategies and accords and laws and that we just need to measure it differently. Um, uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, that we just need to measure things differently. That we just need to be, you know, change GDP to genuine progress indicator, and that everything will sort of fall in, into line. Which is why uh, they get very confused by papers in the research agenda that say, well, actually, um, this problem of conspicuous consumption can't be solved with laws. P people conspicuously consume because they lack. Uh, an identity that provides them with a deep sense of self and meaning. So if you really want to, uh, if you really want to curb conspicuous consumption, you need to fulfill people's happiness more. You can't just measure it. You need to, you need to fill it better. Um, you need to find ways through, and then people will argue different ways of finding that, um, working less, uh, uh, working less is a big one for the newer generation, but also um, community orientation is a really big one. Having community groups uh, emerge and have power and autonomy over their own ability to self-regulate and to make their own rules that are appropriate for the spaces that they're in. And that if you allow communities to do that, they might you know, develop a meaningful project as a group that will help curb consumption. But these new arguments that are so that argument there that's based in psychology and sociology and um, economics of happiness and well-being um, doesn't make a lot of sense to traditional ecological economists who say well we just we just need to measure happiness and then people will want to maximize happiness because whatever we measure is what people want to maximize um, and that's obviously not the case um, and that the same and so the, my paper in the research agenda on advertising, uh, these same systems that are keeping people from, that, that are making people conspicuously consume, 
um, are also obscuring truth and radicalizing political opinions to the extent that even if you did put a law or if you did put a law forward and it was a really good one that was gonna save the planet, there's no way, there's no way. Too many people, there's too many vested interests. There's too much politicization of truth. Um, and so these issues of, of truth and uh, community become central to ecological economics and to the ability of us to respond to those things if you wanna manage the decline, uh, if you wanna you know, design it, uh, or you can just let it be disaster. Like Peter's book says, you can choose, uh, choose which one to go down. Um, oh, I don't know how to answer your question, Rick. Dave, do you have an... Rick, do you want to uh, <laughs> try, it ver try it verbally? <laughs> no, um, the, the one thing when I was looking over that table that you showed in table five, the one thing that to me didn't stand out, and I haven't had time to really take it all in, um, is, the, is the ethics of virtues. And, you know, if you think about uh, complexity science and coming up with uh, simple rules for guiding uh, parameters around how people can act, um, so one of the questions that I've been asking people and uh, it is, you know, if, if you're going to, what constellation of three to five cardinal, this is an old Plato question, you know, but I don't think Plato's selection of virtues, the ones that we need to deal with the, the, the complex web of self-inflicted problems in the 21st century. But if we're, if we're all operating on different values and virtues uh, systems, then we're not going to be uh, aligned. And um, so the idea of thinking through well, what three to five cardinal virtues would you choose to help manage um, the complexities of getting people to look in the same direction with enough convergence that they're willing to, 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 to build a future for all. Um, so that's the question. It's a big, hairy, audacious question, but one we don't have time to entirely spend on now. But I think it's an important question to ask. Well, and it's, so there's a guy, uh, his name is Clive Spash in ecological economics, and he's made this whole sort of branch called social ecological systems. And the first thing he does is he, his, he says, we need common values. And he lays out a table of common values. Um, I can't if, remember. What yeah, if I can just, but one of the, one of the limitations, are, one of our illiteracies is differentiating between virtues and values. And we tend to focus on va values before virtues. And I get involved with circular arguments saying, do our virtues guide our values or do our values guide our virtues? And which way does it go? It's a worthwhile discussion having, and I've had some very interesting conversation on that topic. Uh, I, won't, I, won't, I won't share my bias, but I'll just say what the polarity is. And it can either be dysfunctional and it becomes either or, or it can be complementary and be both and. So, um, but um, I'll, I'll, leave it, I'll leave it up to your own frames of reference to justify uh, which part of the circularity is more important. Sure, and I would say that the table that he does is, I think it's probably, I don't think he's a philosopher by training or anything. I would say it's probably a mix of, of values and virtues to some extent. Like there's a lot of principles or like ways we should behave. And then there are things like, um, you know, science, like prioritizing scientific knowledge, like putting it as a virtue of like, this is what we should generally fall back on. Uh, this is where we should come from. And so it ends up being a bit of a mix. Um, and he's engaged with that quite extensively and had a lot of people engage back with him uh, on that list very extensively. But it's a good, a good starting point. And also, um, there's a book by Peter Brown and Peter Timmerman called Ethics. Is it called Ethics for the Anthropocene? Something yeah, like that. Yeah. Anyway, it's, there. Uh, Peter Brown is a, uh, I mean, he's very much into virtue ethics. And so it goes into that really extensively as well. So if that's a question you're deeply interested in, those are two ecological economists who wrote a book specifically about it. If you could type yeah, so, so the author that Katie was referencing was Clive Spash and his sort of subfield is called social ecological economics. Yeah, I'm just looking for that book for you. Oh, it's called Ecological Economics for the Anthropocene, an emerging paradigm. 
oh, I just sent you the Amazon link, which is sorry, <laughs> gross. But, <laughs> Uh, who's the author that I just referenced? Uh, was that Peter Brown and Peter Timmerman? Is that the, does that answer that question? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm just looking at the other questions. Incentives and measures for ecological economics. Not really. No. Yeah, so, so Elena, with respect to um, Measures and variables, the difficulty here is because we're, we're dealing with so many different types of systems. Um, yeah. They're all complex, but, but they're all, you know, societies and, and people and, and organisms and ecosystems all obey, don't obey necessarily, but, but you have to understand them using a different, uh, entirely different framework. Um, what they all have in common is that they're all metabolic patterns. And so that's a very powerful sort of unifying theory. And there is a lot of work in ecological economics looking at social and ecological metabolism. And I've been involved in a lot of that kind of work with Mario G. and Pietro in the Barcelona School. There, there's also the Vienna School with Marina Fischer Kowalski, and they do um, material energy flow analysis. And the more American school of thought with that kind of thing is. Um, from the, uh, the SUNY system in New York um, that comes out of um, Charles Hall. And that's where the concept of energy return on investment comes from. Is everyone familiar with EROI energy return on investment? Is that someone everyone, something everyone's encountered? Yeah, okay. So, so, that's, so those, are, those in ecological economics are, are the traditional sort of like biophysical metrics. And so moving forward, um, um, people like Kate Walworth are thinking of uh, key metrics as things like the happiness index or, or I'm not actually sure. Um, there was another one. Um, uh, would those, uh, would there be telltales? I'm thinking of things like the craft dinner index uh, or the leaders yeah. of milk index. Um, well, there are, there are um, in, in, Biophysical accounting, there are supposedly telltales um, of when you can see like a, you know, obviously diminishing marginal return on energy investment uh, puts you in a situation where, you know, if, you were, if your society were an organism, it would be starving even if it, even if it were still eating. Um, that's, that's the kind of, um, that's the kind of situation that biophysical economists are concerned with. Things like peak oil or the net energy cliff or the idea that we're putting so much into acquiring our energy and materials that like uh, we're getting to a point where it's becoming uneconomic. We're not producing an absolute surplus anymore, right? Um, and so those are the kind of uh, indicators that they're concerned with because they're, they're thinking more in terms of the limits to growth in terms of stuff, right? Biophysical resources, non-renewable biophysical resources. Although it does apply to renewable biophysical resources in that um, there are diminishing marginal returns on things like wind power, depending on where you put it. So um, that's, that's how they think of it. Um, people like Kate Rawworth are looking at the planetary boundaries. Is everyone familiar with the planetary boundaries framework? Have you seen that sort of like, um, yeah, let me see if I can find you a graphic for that. And so that comes straight out of complex adaptive systems. Right? Okay, Wikipedia. <laughs> um, and the issue with that is that um, we, we, we do have a sense of when we're beginning. And the problem with thresholds, right, in complex adaptive systems is that we can say with great scientific confidence that they're there. Uh, but we can say with very little confidence where they are. And we don't know where the tipping points are. Uh, we're not going to. So with respect to the planetary boundaries, we have some confidence that like we've overshot a bunch of them, biodiversity loss being the most concerning. Uh, but with other ones, we have a little bit of breathing room. So those are, you know, in, in the limits discourse, the kind of indicators that concerned with right now. Um, in the more social aspect of ecological economics, what we're talking about, the happiness index and things like that. Uh, I'm not 
very familiar with that. <laughs> I am, but I think we're I think we're wrapping up. And I do just want to say oh, yeah. that the ecological footprint, it does the accounting of what we use and what we have very, very well. It's a yeah. plug for my work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But thank you all so much. I think that this is uh, end time. Um, so I really appreciate everyone, your questions and chatting. It's been fun. Thanks, Katie and Dave. It's, uh, it's interesting to hear where the field is. Um, so I attended uh, on, on Dave's suggestion, um, a CANSI meeting um, of the, uh, uh, a couple of years ago in the summer. And when I showed up, Katie I said, oh, glad to see you here. You're the systems ringer. And I didn't know what that meant <laughs> until I started speaking to the, the group and realized that they didn't really talk about systems that much. So uh, I'm encouraged by the discourse that's going on and um, the change that's happening. In some respects, I feel like uh, we're in the, like in the 1960s again, we're reinventing the whole field. So I expect yeah. there's going to be a lot of change. And so maybe in another year, we'll have you back and uh, seeing if there's any change from a year to year. Um, for uh, November, I guess I could actually probably post for Peter, that Peter will be leading that session, and I, I think it's going to be an RSD debriefing, and however he organizes that, but <laughs> it sounds like that's going to be the logical thing to be doing. So I'll set that up, and uh, Peter will send me a link, and we'll be off as usual. So see everybody in November. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, David. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Nice seeing you all. See you soon. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.